Hello friends. We continue now with Rays and the Initiations webinar commentary on part two of that book. We're on programs 15 and on page 371. And we've been working out the uh, manifestations of the will of God um, as dynamic impression from Shambhala, magnetic telepathy, uh, impulsed by hierarchy and uh, in which they participate and which they stimulate and radiatory sensitivity uh, the human response one point should here be made the entry of a member of the human family into the ranks of the initiates and his participation in the activity of some one or other of the ashrams produces a movement out of the hierarchy of some master and into the highest center of all. So here we're talking about really um, entry, uh, entry uh, truly into the hierarchy, uh, entry into an ashram, and not just on the periphery of the ashram. Okay, so the master moves on. The movement in hierarchy of some master into the highest center of all, and presumably what is meant there is Shambhala. Uh, though not all masters do move into Shambhala, it is necessary in some, in many cases, most cases, to be a Chohan, but perhaps that is what is indicated here showhandship is taken <coughs> because one is still called a master even if one is a chohan witness master moria master kutumi and so forth so forth master jesus all of them chohans and still called masters it has this effect only after the entering initiate has taken the third initiation exactly not just um, the initiations of the threshold okay not uh, just the initiations of the uh, threshold, and can therefore take his part in the hierarchical life as a monadic expression susceptible to impression from Shambhala. This is a very important statement. Um, can therefore uh, take his part. Um, in the hierarchical life as a monadic expression. Now, what is this saying? It's saying that if we, or when we, so when we take the third degree, we become a, quote, monadic expression and uh, can be impressed by Shambhala because monads are, in that sense, members of Shambhala. So, the third degree is no small matter. One becomes, uh, even if in an incipient sense, a monadic expression. When a master thus emerges, it's kind of interesting because then, you know, if the master were to become a Chohan, then it would be related to the number three. The entering initiate is of the third degree, and the uh, master who is moving on is of the sixth degree. Those two numbers are related, as DK has told us. When a master thus emerges, he is immediately confronted with the choice between the seven paths. Nine paths now. Uh, page 412, I believe. We'll, we'll later see this, although they, the other two paths are not elaborated. With, with this development and decision, we shall later deal. Um, the seven paths are all concerned with purpose. Okay. Just as the seven ashrams are all concerned with the plan, and this is such an important, uh, such an important distinction. Purpose is uh, much more largely conceived. It has to do. What can we call purpose? Um, I'll call it this for the moment. Uh, purpose is the pattern of destiny, uh, and especially 
monadic destiny, the pattern. Purpose and pattern are inseparable, at least in my mind. There is, as you will later see, a direct relation between the seven paths and the seven ashrams. Uh, yes, but from any ashram one can journey onto any of the seven paths, so only one of them will be correct. It is not, strictly speaking, an ashramic matter which path is chosen. Though we shall not deal with the subject at all, there is likewise a correspondence in the third major center, humanity. Okay, so maybe this has to do with uh, ray groups. Anyway, there is some sort of choice involved for the human being and some sort of some sort of sevenfold objective. Some sort of sevenfold objective for human beings as as human beings. Okay, HBS should be human beings as human beings. Okay, so you have uh, curiously therefore interrelated the seven paths, aha, right, the seven races are the uh, correspondence. Sevenfold objective for human beings is human beings and here we learn that the uh, seven races are the correspondence. So the seven paths, the seven rays, they are ray ashrams, therefore the seven ashrams, and the seven races, and these races are, we understand, array related. Um, for instance, the, well, the uh, Lemurian race, uh, closely related to the third ray, in a, in a certain sense, well, also to the fifth, the Atlantean race to the fourth ray, but also to the sixth, the Aryan race to the fifth ray, but also to the third, and in its later phases to the second, and then there will be the sixth root race, which is uh, related to the number six, of course, but also to the number four, and the seventh root race, which will be related of course, the seventh ray, but also to the first ray. Students will be will do well to bear in mind that these relationships are the result of the involutionary activity of the life expression of the Lord of the world. Okay, so the Lord of the world um, is manifesting through um, various parts of the planetary planetary scheme uh, and is manifesting in a sevenfold manner. The key to the mystery of differentiation is found by the master. Yeah, well, what, what a mystery that is. Because this, this key, this um, key to the mystery of differentiation is the key to emanation uh, because emanation is the means and the medium of differentiation um, from the one to the many. The one into two, one into three, one into seven, seven into forty-nine, uh, seven also into twelve, forty-nine into three hundred forty-three. There are many uh, numerical divisions which will result from the emanative um, process and uh, deeply entrenched with uh, in esoteric Buddhism at least is the whole idea of emanation and it explains how a lesser being can be a greater being. Okay, within um, Buddhism, especially uh, Buddhism as it considers the esoteric side of manifestation uh, is the theory of emanation which explains how a lesser being can be a greater being. Uh, sometimes we, we talk about uh, a particular uh, incarnation of a high being as if he is a still higher being. Well, emanatively it is so. 
So the key to the mystery of differentiation is found by the master when he is faced by the choice of the seven paths. And interestingly, you know what rules that initiation? It is the um, is the third. Oh, how about that? Is the third ray, which comes through Libra, sign of choice, which rules uh, initiation of decision. Uh, the IOD. Okay, I think I'm going to, we may be dealing with that quite a bit, so IOD, and we'll talk about um, initiation of decision. Okay. At that high point of will expression, because, uh, because so idea identified with the will of the planetary logos um, and uh, of greater wills beyond, in fact of one's own uh, essential will, he discovers the secret of that evolutionary process which proceeds from unity to differentiation. Well, you know, it's, uh, let's just call it, maybe we can call it the, um, the, the individualization. Well, no, no, it's not that. We'll call it the involutionary phase of the evolutionary process, which proceeds from unity to differentiation through emanation, if I may say. Um, I must be some sort of old Buddhist because this thing was just built into me when I started to work on my Infinity Book, not knowing ever what would come out of it. I just faced emanation immediately, at least for me as the only way to explain the one and the many. And uh, how that proceeds without any reduction of consciousness on the higher levels even though there is an attenuation of consciousness through the emanative process, all of that had to be somewhat solved. And I made my attempt in it. Have I forgotten what I've written? I hope not, but uh, it was a long time ago. At that high point of will expression, he discovers the secret of the evolutionary process which proceeds from unity to differentiation. So that is what we usually call uh, involution. And from differentiation to unity again... Uh, which is the phase of the process in which we are now, now, with a lot of trouble when you write not for now, involved. Individualization, initiation, and identification of the three main stages of the evolutionary activity of the life of God and condition the quality of the three divine centers. Identification, then, is related to Shambhala, just the way initiation is related to hierarchy and individualization or becoming apparently separate uh, human being is, um, hmm, why can't I get this? Okay, let's try it again. Um, becoming this uh, apparently separate uh, separate human being is related to the human kingdom. The four related septinates uh, enumerated above eventually produce a synthesis. So the, these are the, the races, the ashrams, the rays, and the paths. Let's remind ourselves of this. Um, only we'll go in the opposite direction. The races, the ashrams, the rays, and the paths on the way of higher evolution. Uh, these enumerated above eventually produce a synthesis which will consummate upon the cosmic mental plane. Presumably, uh, this uh, can only happen on certain of the paths. Um, the ultimate uh, path uh, to which all the 
paths lead, uh, probably uh, relates to the cosmic buddhic plane. Well, at least um, we know that the Pleiades is a source of cosmic buddhi, a source along with the dragon. <sighs> well, we speak of things, you know, we cannot fathom. But anyway, the source of, of, of that superb energy, we hardly know what buddhi is, yet alone cosmic buddhi. And the Pleiades as well is the center of the hub of the wheel to which all paths lead eventually after leading to various constellations. So if the Pleiades is such a great source of cosmic buddhi and also the destination of all the paths, then we can assume that ultimately cosmic buddhi will be the destination of um, all the paths even though some of them simply lead simply <laughs> to the cosmic astral plane and others to the cosmic mental plane may be lower and higher parts of the cosmic mental plane. This, of course, is beyond my powers to teach or explain. Uh, as I am not yet a liberated master, uh, what should we say, of the, um, of the seventh, well, let's say of the, sixth or seventh initiation. Though I am a liberated human being, he always teaches, you know, of the fifth initiation. It, it, inevitably, no matter what Master DK is saying, because he is so identified with this teaching Ray, something comes forth from him which is of teaching value. So it makes us ponder, right? What is a liberated master? Well, okay. A master is of the fifth degree and has to be liberated in something, doesn't he? So it's at least the sixth degree, maybe the seventh, although eventually, you know, onto the ninth uh, initiation would be uh, a liberation from the cosmic mental, cosmic physical plane and into the kinds of planes, cosmic planes we're talking about. Liberated human being, well, you know, even at the fourth initiation, in a way, uh, one is that. Even at the fourth initiation, one is that. Now, I don't know whether this was written after the time when um, Master DK's identity had been discovered. Uh, uh, somewhere it's explained how it happened, um, that Alice uh, Bailey had left his name at the bottom of some document. And then it was uh, realized. And DK said, well, look, this is a test for you. Uh, how you handle the discovery of my identity is a test. In the human center, the man becomes identified with himself. Okay, and uh, let's just say uh, individualization starts this process. And this is, uh, in the Leo sense, uh, the I am phase. In the hierarchy, he becomes identified with the group in the Leo sense. This is uh, I am that. In Shambhala, he becomes identified with the planetary whole. And in the Leo phases, we will say, I am that and that I am. Or I am that and that am I, or I am that I am, which maybe is the most mysterious of all and the most significant. I am, am, that I am. There's some kind of um, circularity going on there. The Ouroboros, the snake, seems to be swallowing its tail. The union of subject and object seems to be occurring. Um, there is identify, identification with the planetary whole and, of course, the never-ending series of identifications until one realizes that one is the universal whole and that even that is simply a fragment, uh, what do I sometimes call it, um, an ultimate negligibility <laughs> when compared, and you can't really compare, but when compared with uh, absoluteness. When that takes place, he is aware for the first time that other identifications lying beyond the planetary ring pass not confront him. Indeed, they do. 
because there's one ring pass knot after another, and one realizes somehow increasingly that one is the life of each of those rings pass knot. His choice of one or other of the paths is conditioned by the quality of his previous identifications, which are, in their turn, conditioned by his ray type. So, there is a relationship existing between the uh, path, whoop, don't want that to happen, between the path chosen and the ray type and probably the monadic ray type, both major and minor. And uh, the subray and a subray of the monad, uh, the soul ray, will probably not be insignificant. Insignif. Insignif. Okay. <laughs> I guess I didn't get that one. So, um, so the path will be conditioned by his previous identifications, and his previous identifications, how he goes about doing that, will be conditioned by his ray type, especially his monadic ray type. And as I said, there does seem in DK's writings to be a major monadic ray and what I would call a subsidiary ray a minor monadic ray. Now, whether or not they are both on the monadic plane or whether one of them is on the heroic plane and the other on the monadic plane, I have yet to establish, though I think, as I think about it, there is a uh, liberation into a still greater ring pass knot within the three persons of the logoic trinity. In other words, every monad probably finds its place within one of those three persons. And they are, uh, in a way, cosmic... Uh, well, they are the three Logoi, the subsidiary to the solo Logos, and they have their home, or their, not really home, but their present focus upon the Logoic plane. Passing from these broad generalizations, which in reality lie far beyond our present grasp, we can theorize, right? But which will have their future usefulness, so DK can see far ahead, right? Um, hmm. A lot farther than we can see. Let us now consider the hierarchy as it exists in the consciousness of Sanat Kumara as his ashram. So he is, uh, you know, he is the highest example of the teaching ray on our uh, planet. And, uh, or should we say, within our planetary scheme, planetary uh, planetary scheme, and as it constitutes the noble middle path. Let us consider the hierarchy as it exists in the consciousness of Sanakumara, as is Ashram, and as it constitutes the noble middle path. So, you know, there has been a question. What is this noble middle path? When you look at the um, Kundalini setup, you, you wonder whether the soul represents the noble middle path, or whether somehow the central channel, which leads to Shambhala, uh, expresses itself on the first ray, and that ultimately that is the noble middle path. But uh, here it is so well defined that hierarchy itself and is the noble middle path. Uh, so, you know, let us ponder hierarchy as the noble noble middle path and fills the intermediate and the mediating place between Shambhala and humanity the position of the ashram must never be forgotten so maybe we should brand that into our consciousness hierarchy is the noble middle path and our task uh, is first to tread the path into hierarchy before we can think of uh, entering Shambhala. It's so amusing to me sometimes, you know, to you know, to see you know see the people who find themselves entering into Shambhala before they 
can confirm that they have in any way really entered hierarchy. But we're always um, overly eager and putting the cart before the horse. And we don't have a good uh, conception of time and of the, uh, the length, all relative of course, but the length of the evolutionary path and the paths of discipleship and initiation and the higher paths. We, we really somehow in our brain consciousness have not very good estimates of such durations. All right. Now, what have we here? I think I better be careful because can I have left out a diagram? I don't know. Looks like I've done something like that. Uh, so let's see. And we're on page 373. Plays and the initiations. Whenever I see a big white space like that, I, I better check about whether some diet, and, and indeed, uh, well, the diagram isn't really left out. It's like this. Um, if I will just go back to this, perhaps I can find the diagram, and I'll do it this way. One, two, there it is. All right, that diagram does, after all, exist, as long as I don't work in draft mode. Right, right, so I have restored the diagram. So, seven groups of ashrams within the hierarchy, because, you know, all the major ray ashrams have subsidiaries, and we are told that they are not yet fully formed, even, but they are gradually being formed, and who knows exactly when they will be totally formed, but there will be 49 altogether. So, it is because the first ray of will or power to its ashram is related to Shambhala, that the Master Maurya is the head of all truly esoteric schools. I sometimes quote that and say he's the head of all esoteric schools, but I should be more careful because there are so many esoteric schools which are not uh, truly esoteric schools. This is a very... Uh, and let's just say that... Um, Esoteric schools, therefore, are related to Shambhala. And uh, the mystery they will reveal is a Shambhalic mystery. He talks about that um, in one of the later rules. Is it uh, Rule 12 or Rule 13, where the purposes of Sanat Kumara uh, are discussed and that all truly uh, esoteric schools will approach the revelation of that purpose. In the esoteric enterprise and in the work done by disciples in the ashram, the will is developed so that purpose may be eventually understood. And this is a very important statement. So, uh, uh, if uh, thou shalt do the will of God, thou shalt know. And in this case, know the purpose. So it is somehow the ability, uh, once that will is uh, realized uh, to some measure, if that will is realized to some measure and one performs that will, a revelation will come. Um, we have, in a way, the idea of purpose above the will, There's, but sometimes purpose and will are equated, and sometimes will is considered as the great uh, driving energy, which uh, unfolds as purpose. So the will is developed so the purpose may eventually be understood. Right now, it's quite enough for us to understand the procedures of the divine plan and the, real, uh, the reason why the divine plan exists and uh, how it may uh, express an aspect of purpose, which we may come to understand. But it, it's a huge um, 
point of view that's needed to really understand purpose. Uh, and I'm just going to ask this as a question, the following. Can anyone really understand the purpose um, of our planetary logos if he does not have monadic consciousness? Uh, in other words, there are uh, different points, vantage points, from which to view plan and purpose. And the higher we go, the closer we come to that great vision, which our planetary logos has, of his objective, which we can also call purpose. And uh, when we are identified as the monad, as pure being, as a uh, one that is not hampered by uh, the various lower states of matter, then we can um, come closer to uh, seeing the same vision the planetary logos sees, not to anywhere near the same extent, but something of that vision uh, is uh, given to us. Something of planetary logoic vision is conferred and that planetary logoic uh, vision is purpose at least for the planetary logos so um, he uh, the disciple in the ashram I suppose he relates the three points of the triangle composed of the hierarchy uh, the world of souls on the mental plane, higher mental plane, and those human souls who, on all rays, are ready for contact with the hierarchy. Um, well, who is the he? Is the he somehow Master Mori, or is the he the advancing disciple? So let's see, we have the hierarchy, the world of souls, and human beings, but not just human beings. Um, not just ordinary human beings not just ordinary, non-aspiring human beings, but those who are ready for contact with hierarchy. They have made contact with the souls, and this is registered in the hierarchy. So the triangle is therefore as follows. Um, so he is the head of all true esoteric schools, truly esoteric schools. I should really expand that so it really comes home with the head of all truly esoteric schools. Uh, the will is developed uh, so the purpose may be understood. He relates the three points of the triangle. Well, it sounds like it could be either the disciple or Master Moria. He relates the three points of the triangle composed of hierarchy, the world of souls on the mental plane, and those human souls who on all the rays are ready for contact with hierarchy. So hierarchy, world of souls, and human beings. Okay, so all of us have a, uh, a part to play on the higher mental plane within the world of souls, and all of us are also human beings, aspiring personalities, and those who are contacting the world of souls, and as we do that, we can begin to contact hierarchy directly. Now, having said that, I can go back to draft mode in which the diagram will disappear. As the externalization of the ashram proceeds, we will say the ashram as a whole, those souls upon the physical plane who are ready for enlightenment will find their way into the new group of world servers. They're ready for enlightenment. Enlightenment is coming to some degree at the uh, second initiation because you have to have spiritual intelligence and be mentally illumined at the second degree. And the new group of world servers is composed, uh, the true members of it, those who are truly members of the new group of world servers, um, have taken the second degree. So the real illumination will come at the, well, they're all real, but at the third degree and increasing revelation at the fifth and so forth. 
Um, so they will find their way into the new group of world servers if they are moving towards the third initiation because they are second degree initiates. This group will increasingly assume potent relation between the units of life within its periphery. Assume potent relation, increasingly potent relation between the units of life within its periphery, uh, the ashram, and humanity. So um, let's just see what exists in terms of relation between the members of the new uh, of the new group of world servers new group of world new group world servers today is small in comparison with the type of relationship which is coming from the point of view of the new group of world servers from one point of view the new group of world servers can be regarded not only as a relating group of course, then the second ray and the seventh ray would be very important there, and, and the fourth ray, which rules it, basically, but also as a great transforming station. Dowered later, though not noticeably so at the present time, with two functions in relation to the ashram. So, uh, ash, ashramic bestowal of two types is coming. Not so much noticed today. And of course, this was written back in 46 to 49. Have the servers increased to such a point that this is dowering has occurred? But anyway, a great transforming station. You know, thus, they're going to have a intermediary function, transforming energies from above to below and from below to above. So one function, one function, these are, okay, below, functions of the Google World Servers in relation to the ashram, I suppose. One function is to enable externalizing units of perfection, relative perfection, but for us certainly perfection. These are the higher initiates and masters to step down their individual potency to such a degree that they will be able to work in physical objectivity upon Earth with no undesirable effects upon humanity. Master Hilarion described, you know, the, uh, the undesirable effects. And DK also has said that when the hierarchy contacts ordinary um, humanity directly in an unmodulated manner, it freezes the condition of the ordinary human being. And Master Hilarion has described, you know, don't put a muddy foot upon the electric ladder, or you will be frozen in place and you will not be able to move. So I think um, uh, hierarchy has to be very careful about precipitating the negative conditions or, or freezing the negative conditions which uh, exist within most human beings. Of course, the Christ was astonishing in his ability to walk with ordinary human beings, as was the Buddha. So they must have known how to do it, you know, without uh, releasing the fullness of all the energy which they were inwardly. So uh, it, it's going to be a transforming station downward in that sense, right? A trans, whoop, oh, 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 let me go back. Uh, so, uh, a transforming station downwards. Uh, what do we call it? Modulating higher energies. So they produce uh, no ill, ill effect upon uh, ordinary human beings. No undesirable effects, okay? That's what we are looking for here. No undesirable effects upon humanity. I refer to average and undeveloped human beings, and this is what we've been discussing. Should Students should bear in mind that contact with those who are initiates of high degree and members of an ashram has the following three effects upon um, humanity. And maybe this is where Long ago, I remember 
this. You know, uh, uh, this, uh, that, which follows is a reason for hierarchical caution in outer contacts. On evolved men, aspirants, probationers, and disciples, the effect is, <coughs> excuse me, stimulating and magnetic, drawing such uh, people towards the hierarchy. On average human beings, capable of little response, yet susceptible to impact and sensitive to impression, uh -huh. the effect is not helpful and is often destructive because their etheric bodies are not competent to entertain and employ such high vibrations. Uh, you know, so people say, well, why doesn't um, the master simply uh, show up and talk to me? But we can understand that uh, for the unprepared uh, individual, there can be uh, too much energy and destruction. On undeveloped human uh, humanity, the effect has been called condensation or concretization. All their natural qualities, the qualified substance of the three bodies, are solidified. Thus, they create an automatic barrier to entry of the too high impulses and vibrations. So, um, a barrier. Now, this is what I was talking about. A barrier is created. Um, and the solidification of the normal, which repulses that which is higher or really too high, because if it has a destructive effect on the etheric body of average man, what would the effect be on the un, on undeveloped humanity? And so there will be really no recognition of these higher beings, and they may pass among the undeveloped and have not be detected. Of course, in the ancient days, when the god kings walked among the very primitive human beings of the time, maybe there was a different setup, which allowed some sort of teaching and guidance to occur without uh, negative results. Maybe, maybe in some ways, Lemurian man had uh, a greater ability to recognize something of a higher nature because he was still not totally uh, densified, as he became later in uh, Atlantean times and maybe in early Aryan times. So what we're looking at here is um, the New Group of World Servers, the functions of the New Group of World Servers in relation to the ashram. That's what we're looking at at the moment. So allowing the externalizing hierarchy to appear with a uh, mediating group which will help uh, to mediate energies which are normally too high for um, constructive absorption. Then, the second function is to enable those who are making definite soul contact, uh, reorienting themselves and nearing the periphery of the ashra. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> The second function is to enable those who are making definite soul contact, reorienting themselves and nearing the periphery of the ashram, to absorb with profit the radiation of the hierarchy. I mean, the New Group of World Service is just such a group. They are uh, making definite soul contact. They are reorienting themselves. They are nearing the periphery of the, I'm sorry, the ashram. Uh, is it the pollen, or what is it? Uh, the ashram, and to absorb with profit the radiation of hierarchy. So, uh, if we enter the uh, Nukubo world servers through merit and demonstrated service, we have a hierarchical opportunity offered to us. 
So this is um, a, mag a magnetic, uh, it, it's a body which receives uh, as aspiring servers and initiates of a certain degree in the um, early initiations, the initiations of the threshold, a body which receives them and offers them opportunity. I would like at this point to refer back to the time sense in relation to the hierarchy and its work, to which I referred uh, a few pages back, the time sense. You know, the an ordinary time sense is probably the result of the limitations of the physical brain, but uh, even our planetary logos does have a time-space schedule, we are told. So time may be an illusion, but it's a very uh, actual illusion, we might say. Um, okay, it involves the inability of the average disciple to think in terms of the ashram, the ashram of the Christ, representing Sanat Kumara. Can we think in terms of the ashram, or are we always thinking about our own progress, spiritual progress, in relation to uh, an ashram, a master, etc.? The inability of the average disciple, well, you know, in one place, DK pretty well tells us, and aren't you all average disciples? It, does not help to consider yourself as anything else. When he turns his thoughts to the master <coughs> and the radiatory and magnetic group which he has attracted to himself, the disciple almost inevitably thinks in terms of my master and his ashram, and not in terms of the larger ashram of which Sarakumara is the head and of which the three great lords are the coordinators. My master and his ashram, my this, my that, it's a pretty sixth ray devoted response as we find in the law of um, the technique of integration for the sixth ray. Yet this is not in any sense a statement of truth. We, we have somehow divided, uh, partialized the vision of the greater whole. There is one great ashram, the hierarchy, radiating after due absorption of light, understanding, and power from Shambhala. And this inflow is adequate to hierarchical need radiating after due absorption of light, understanding, and power from Shambhala, and this inflow is adequate to hierarchical need, as it seeks not only to aid not only the human evolution, but all the other evolutions of which humanity, in several cases, knows nothing. Occasionally there are hints about other evolutions, and certainly we don't know much about the Deva evolution, of which much is already said, and there are some other hidden evolutions, uh, which humanity is not especially to come in contact with. But there is one great ashram, the hierarchy, and I think I'll make that, you know, quite bold. One great ashram, the hierarchy, radiating, radiating um, as it seeks to aid not only the human evolution, but all the other evolutions of which humanity in several cases, several, that's uh, more than three really, isn't it, knows nothing. There are some of these evolutions, you know, in the, in this, uh, beneath the earth, in the caves beneath the earth, uh, for example. The great ashram is likewise magnetic in its effect. So here is one word, it's radiatory. And it's also magnetic in its effect. And through its magnetic potency, brought about by the inflow of first-ray power, and uh, we must remember that uh, magnetism, essentially, is related to the first-ray 
DK explains that electricity and magnetism and uh, our ordinary experiments show that to be the case that where the electricity is flowing we can relate that to electric fire of course there will be a magnetic field generated the great ashram is likewise magnetic in its effect and through its magnetic potency brought about by an inflow of first-rate power units of life and devotion human beings are brought into the ashram as disciples in preparation for initiation so um, the magnetism generated draws people into an ashram uh, in which they are prepared for initiation so radiatory and magnetic both and uh, this due to uh, shambolic uh, inflow okay so human beings are brought into the ashram as disciples in preparation for initiation people are apt to regard magnetic potency as the evidence of love and here's where he explains this you know i, I find that so many of the thoughts kind of lodged in my mind and brain um, are really from this book with the source well and truly forgotten but coming back now and reading with care I see what the origin uh, is people are act, apt to regard magnetic potency as evidence of love it is in reality evidence of the radiation of love when enhanced by the and strengthened by first ray energy oh, so important it is an admixture if I may use such a peculiar term of love and will which produces radiation oh, it's so well stated and uh, you know we, it, we have to ponder it people are apt to regard magnetic potency as the evidence of love it is in reality evidence of the radiation of love when enhanced strengthened stimulated impulsed by first ray energy magnetism is you know <laughs> magnetism is it is the admixture if i may use such a peculiar term of love and will which produces radiation it is the conscious use by the hierarchy of the power coming from Shambhala which results in the magnetic impact and the spiritual pull this is so related to the second ray of course which draws the soul incarnated in the body towards the ashram so without the uh, without the magnetic uh, impulse from Shambhala upon hierarchy the great magnetism of hierarchy as we experience it would not exist in its fullness this pull is directed towards the world of souls which is through its manifesting units under going experience in the school of life yet overshadowed by the soul on its own level it is the overshadowing soul which absorbs and utilizes the magnetic power and which from soul levels transfers it to the souls of men you know we are speaking of the uh, we seem to be speaking of the one soul In the world of souls uh, this pull is directed towards the world of souls which is through its manifesting units the world of souls through its manifesting units is undergoing experience in the school of life yet overshadowed by the soul on its own level and that's a, a, a singular well every 
little unit is overshadowed by its own soul, but there is only one soul. The uh, third fundamental of the uh, secret doctrine uh, tells us there is but one oversoul, and all souls are members of or aspects of that one oversoul. So the world of souls is affected by the shambolic impact, the spiritual pull which draws the soul incarnated in the body. But, of course, the spiritual pull is the result of the world of souls uh, being affected. Uh, and they are uh, the, the units, um, the manifesting units are drawn towards the world of souls. Let's see. The manifesting units are drawn towards the world of souls. And it really is a soul event uh, which draws these units, a soul event as impulsed by a spirit, uh, well, a spirit impulse. A spirit impulse has caused the soul impulse which draws the manifesting units into the world of souls. There is still another point upon which I would like to touch, owing to the fact that the law which governs the hierarchy is the second systemic law, the law of attraction. Students are apt to think that magnetism is a second ray quality. Now, owing to the fact that hierarchy and the second systemic law work together, this law of attraction, students will think that magnetism is a second ray quality, but he's already told us something else. They are right insofar uh, that all the systemic laws are expressions of the life of God through the medium at this time of the second ray which makes our solar system a second ray solar system. So, right in one sense, all the systemic laws um, are uh, mediated through the uh, second, second ray. Nope. S-E-C, S-C-R-Y. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. All other laws and qualities for a law from the divine angle is the motivating qualified agent of the divine will. As understood in Shambhala, all other laws and qualities are related to the second ray as it manifests through our planetary logos with his, uh, his uh, second ray soul now coming increasingly into uh, expression. So, nevertheless, nevertheless, even though um, we are working in a second-ray solar system and through what is becoming very demonstrably a second-ray planet, and that's what all the big struggle is about, this transition from the third-ray soul of humanity, third-ray uh, personality of humanity to a second-ray soul, even so, and even though the laws and qualities are largely conditioned by the great law of attraction ruled by the second ray, even so, magnetic action is more closely allied to first ray functioning than it is to the second ray and is a, an aspect or quality of the law of synthesis. And sometimes I think of the synthetic aspect of the first ray as being on the second subray of the first ray. Uh, we can ask, uh, is synthesis on the second subray of the first ray? Okay, so um, even though it's an admixture, without this first ray functioning, without the expression of this particular aspect or quality of the law of synthesis, which may be, after all, the uh, related to the second aspect of the first ray. Without this, uh, magnetism, as we are understanding it in the hierarchical sense, would not exist. It was this magnetic power of the first ray to which the Christ referred when he said, 
I, if I be lifted up, and A, B interpolates here the ascension initiation, where Christ becomes in full consciousness the living monad, and I would say a monad of the second ray. I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me, the great drawing power and the lifting power as well. He faced then those initiations which would qualify him to become what is esoterically called a Shambhala recipient. And I think, you know, that that um, begins with the sixth initiation because it's the initiation of the monad as the monad and the and Shambhala is the home of those who are living monads in full consciousness. There is in magnetic action more of the element of the will and of an expressing purpose. There is in magnetic action. This is, you know, maybe a little difficult to understand, but there is in magnetic action more of the element of the will and of an expressing purpose purpose. It, in other words, um, if I can put it like this, that monadic destiny is magnetic. Uh, we are drawn towards our destiny as monads. But this is the uh, first aspect of divinity. So um, we, we drive forward towards, uh, drive forward in space. We drive forward in space towards that destiny, but the cosmic magnet is also drawing us towards it. So it has um, our magnetic, uh, our monadic destiny is about the fulfillment of a great purpose which we as monads uh, realize. Well, look, I'm I'm over the edge here. Um, yes, well, <laughs> no italics beyond this point. I'll fill that in, and let's just call this the end of um, raise and initiation webinar commentary program fifteen, and we have made our way uh, pages blank to 375, and I think it's probably 371 uh, to, I believe, yeah, 371 to 375. I should always have that ready to go. And um, this will be the beginning of Ray's initiation webinar commentary program uh, 60, beginning with page uh, page 375. Right. Okay, well, these have been uh, deep thoughts, and we, basically, what we have to understand, you know, let us understand the first ray component of magnetism, drawing us towards our monadic destiny, uh, which means up, uh, at least uh, in the direction of the ascended Christ, who became a uh, conscious monad uh, in that ascension. Okay, you know, we have to ponder on this so we can understand the... Uh, we, we seek to understand dynamic magnetism. That's what we seek to understand. Um, okay. So, I'm a little bit over the time if I want to stick to one hour, and I don't always want to stick to one hour, but let's just say that... Uh, I'll, I'll be pretty close to it at this point. So we'll go on to program 16 shortly. See you soon. Bye-bye.